still out in the foyer, you want to come in, that would be fantastic. We'll get going with the message here. For those who don't know this fine strapping guy here in front of me, this is Ryan Luttrell. Uh, he's uh, preached here once before, uh, a while back, and uh, we thought that we'd uh, bring him in again just because he does a great job. Uh, Ryan is a part of our Charlottetown campus, and he helps with uh, community group and lots of other great stuff. Uh, he works at Bar 1911, serving up coffee and other great stuff. And uh, we just want to thank him for being here today, for bringing the word. Why don't we just pray for him as we get started? God, we thank you for Ryan. We thank you for the words that you've given him today. God, this morning, teach us through Ryan. Allow us to hear your word, the words that you've given to him. Be with Ryan this morning as he presents this passage, God, that you will reign through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. All right, we've got lots to get through today, so I'm going to dive right in. Uh, August 8th, 2009, probably is not a very significant day for most, most people in the room. Uh, but for me, it's a day that I will remember for the rest of my life and probably for the rest of eternity. In my bedroom, bawling my eyes out, was the first time that I had encountered Jesus. And that night, he revealed to me that he was my Lord, and that he was my Savior, and that he was my King. Now, before that day, my life was a complete mess. I was drinking, sneaking out of my house three to four times a week, doing drugs, partying, smoking cigarettes. And now, I don't tell you this to boast, uh, because it's always been very clear to me that, that God was the one who transformed my life. But rather, when God revealed himself to me, he not only changed the actions that I was doing, he also changed the desires behind my actions. And now, I didn't know it at the time, because I hadn't read my Bible or studied theology, but what had actually taken place in that moment was a, was a transformation. I was made into a new creation. That my old self had died and I had now become a new creation, risen into new life with Jesus. And while it wasn't, and still definitely isn't, perfect, it is dramatically different than the life I was living before. But now as different as it was, or as different as it is, there's still many, many sins that I struggle with in my life. Anyone that knows me can definitely attest to this. Whether it's pride, or anger, or jealousy, or any of the other sins that I wrestle with, they're still very present. And I share this with you today because we're picking up our story in Genesis 33, where if you remember from last week, God came to Jacob at night when he was by himself and wrestled with him all night long until the next morning, Jacob ended up prevailing in that fight. And after that, God gave Jacob a new name. He gave him the name of Israel. So he went from being the schemer and manipulator, which is what Jacob means, to his new name, which means God wrestles. Now what this signifies to us is that there was a massive change in the life of Jacob, that he was no longer the schemer, that had died, and he was now the one who wrestled with God. And now, even though Jacob is now a completely different person, his, circumstance, uh, his circumstances from the night before hadn't changed, and how he did a great job of preaching through this last week and teaching us that God isn't as concerned about our circumstances as he is about changing us through the circumstances or in the midst of the circumstances. So Jacob and God finish, rush, finish, finish wrestling, but Jacob is still in the exact same place uh, that he was the night before, waiting anxiously and nervously for a very angry Esau to arrive. Now, if you haven't been with us through our series in Genesis, here's a little backstory on what was going on between the two of them. Esau and Jacob were twin brothers. Esau was born first, and Jacob was born right after him, holding on to Esau's heel. And this is significant because this is originally where Jacob got his name. Heel grabber was another way of demonstrating that he was going to be a schemer and a manipulator. And no one felt the wrath of Jacob's uh, scheming and manipulating quite like Esau. 
Jacob manipulated Esau into trading his birthright for a bowl of stew. And then he lied, manipulated his father into uh, giving Jacob the, uh, the blessing that was meant for Esau. And now we might stop here and say, what's the big deal of a blessing? But a blessing in those days was something that was very different than what we think of it as today. See, a blessing then was a foretelling of what was to come in that person's life. And the blessing, we can find it in Genesis 26. It says this, See the smell of my son is as the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Now, I have a younger brother and I can't imagine if, if he had stolen something like this from me. I mean, growing up, we had some pretty epic fights, uh, but nothing came close to, to what these two were fighting, after, fighting about. So after this happens, their mother, Rebecca, overhears Esau saying that he's going to kill Jacob. So she runs to Jacob uh, and tells him that he needs to run away. And this was the last time that the two, uh, Jacob and Esau, were in the same place. So, and this is where we're going to pick up our text today. So if you have a Bible with you, and I hope you do, uh, you can open it to Genesis 33, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 17. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. It's going to be up on the screen. So Genesis 33, 1 to 17 says this. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. And he put the servants with their children in front, and then Leah with her children and Rachel and Joseph last, last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the servants drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah, likewise, and her children drew near and bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt gracio graciously with me, and because I have enough. Thus he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, let us journey on our way, and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant and I will lead on slowly at the pass of the livestock, at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau said, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, but Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. So let's pray and then we'll dive right in. God, I just thank you so much for your word that all scripture is meant to teach us, to reprove us, and to help us learn about who you are. And that as we learn about who you are, we grow deeper and deeper into a relationship with you. So I just pray that as we open it up today, that you would just move me out of the way and that you would use me as a messenger for you. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So right off the bat, this text, we see that this is a completely different Jacob than we've seen to date. So what I want to do today is take a look at the different aspects of Jacob's life that have changed since he wrestled with God. And then I want to make them extremely practical and look at four things that a transformed life leads to and what those changes look like for us today. And we don't have to wait long to see the first major difference in the way that Jacob is acting. 
Jacob sees Esau coming towards him and quickly organizes his family into different groups similar to the way that he did the night before. But the major difference here is that rather than the groups going out before Jacob, Jacob goes out before the groups. You see, the night before, the groups were going out ahead of Jacob so that if Esau attacked him, he would have time to escape. But this time, Jacob is going out before his family. And this would mean that if, if Esau attacked, his family would have time to get away. This is a massive change from the old Jacob and brings us to our first point today, which is a transformed life leads to radical selflessness. And I'm going to use the word radical a few times this morning, but I want to just clarify it. Radical is a word that we should all learn and add to our vocabulary. Uh, David Platt is the one who uh, kind of coined the term for us, but the faith that we believe in, the Bible that we believe in, is very radical in comparison to the world that we live in today. So when you hear radical today, don't think, oh, this is just for a few, this is for all of us. So diving in, back into this text, I love what Calvin says about this verse. He says this, it happens indeed sometimes that a father, regardless of himself, will expose his life to danger for his children. But holy Jacob's reason was different, for the promise of God was so deeply fixed in his mind that he, disregarding the earth, looked up towards heaven. You see, at a first glance, it would be easy for us to think that the main reason that Jacob was willing to go out ahead of his family was just so that they would survive. But what act but what Calvin is saying here is that Jacob is actually doing this because he trusts in the promise of God. And this promise was given to Abraham first, and then his father Isaac, and now to Jacob. So da Jacob isn't just being selfless here for the sake of his family. Through his actions, Jacob is saying, God, I submit to you, and I submit to what you desire to accomplish through me, and I'm willing to sacrifice whatever you want to have it accomplished. This is a powerful statement that Jacob is making. How many of us in the room can honestly say that we have the same attitude towards God as Jacob does here? Now, I know that very few of us today, if any, have ever been in a situation where we've actually had to put our life on the line for the promises that God has made us. And I've always been the kind of person who would say, oh yeah, I would definitely die for Jesus. If there were a gun held to my head and they said, do you believe in Jesus? I would say yes. But as I've been reading and praying through this text today, God has revealed to me just how foolish I've been in thinking that. You see, I'll say that I would sacrifice my life for Jesus, but I won't sacrifice, sacrifice my social status. I'll say that I would sacrifice my, my life for Jesus, and yet, I won't sacrifice my time in order to serve him the way that he deserves. I'll say that I would sacrifice my life for Jesus, and yet I won't sacrifice status quo. And I think that this last one is one of the biggest ones that we struggle with here on PEI. We're more worried about ruffling someone's feathers or switching up a routine than we are about the thousands of people who have never heard the gospel of Jesus. And I'm the most guilty person in the room of that. You know, I love coming up to Montague on Sundays because you are, and I mean this genuinely, some of the kindest people that I have ever met in my life. I always feel so welcomed here. And something that I hear almost every week that I come up is just how confidently and deeply you believe that God is doing something here on Eastern PEI, in Eastern PEI. And I also hear that you just believe that God is going to cause a revival in Montague. And I think this is amazing. But I want to challenge us on that way of thinking today. You see, it's one thing to say this, but it's a completely different thing to live our lives in a way that demonstrates that we believe this. And the reason for that is that the gospel that we believe in is one that is incredibly offensive to the world around us. The gospel that we believe in is one that says that we are a bad people, completely broken and unable to save ourselves from what we deserve, and that we needed a perfect man. Actually, we needed God himself 
to come down in the form of a man named Jesus Christ to die and pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven. This, this is a message that will completely go against a world that says, you're a good person. You can do whatever you want. You don't need help. Living out the hope that others will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior will re require radical sacrifice. And here in our text today, we see that Jacob is truly living out his hope in God alone. He's willing to sacrifice anything. He's willing to sacrifice his own life for the sake of the promise that God has made to him. But as we've already read this morning, he doesn't die. The two of them meet up and what happens? Esau runs towards Jacob and passionately embraces him in verse 4 and they're instantly reconciled with one another. And this brings us to our second point today, which is a transformed life leads to radical reconciliation. Like the scene in, this, in these verses is straight out of Hollywood. The two run towards each other, probably in slow motion. They get together and they just hold each other for what would seem like hours. And instantly, they're just best friends again. Now, obviously, this isn't what reconciliation looks like in most, of a, in most of our lives. But I want to draw two major things from this. The first is that only God can change someone's heart. You see, most scholars would believe, or most scholars do believe, that Esau was approaching Jacob with the plan to kill him. The 400 people that were coming with him were not a welcoming party. They were an army. And yet, as, J or as Esau sees Jacob, God transforms something in his heart and turns all of that anger and all of that rage into compassion and into love. And so I want to encourage you today, church, that if there's someone who's holding a grudge, if there's someone who is holding something against you, pray for them. Demonstrate love to them. And then be the first one to take the first step towards reconciliation confident that God has the ability to completely change their heart. It may take time, it may be difficult, but I am so confident that God has the ability to do it. Now the second thing is the more challenging part for us today, because most people in the room, myself included, it's easy for us to see when we have wronged someone, or when uh, someone has wronged us, but the challenge is when we have wronged someone else. So the second challenge, the challenging part today is this. If you profess to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and choose not to forgive someone, you're living in unrepentant sin. And it needs to stop because here is the blunt truth. If you do not forgive, God will not forgive you. Now, when I first heard this, it was uh, Mark Clark preaching it, and there were a whole slew of emotions that popped up into my head. Things like, how could he possibly say something like that? Or, God will always forgive me because he's a God of love. But church, this is not something I'm just making up. This is literally what the word of God says. In fact, it's what Jesus says right after he teaches the disciples the prayer that we know as the Lord's Prayer. It's found in Matthew 6, and I'm, I'm going to read the prayer to you. It says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be our, your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and here's the part, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then right after this, because Jesus knew the hearts of the people that he was speaking to, and he knows our hearts today, he expands on one little section of this prayer. And in verse 14, it says this, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, I want to make a very clear distinction here. What Jesus is not saying is that we are forgiven because we forgive others. There's absolutely nothing that we can do to earn our salvation but rather what he's saying is that if we have truly experienced the forgiveness that is found in him alone, we will forgive others. And that 
our unforgiveness is really just a sign of something that is missing in our hearts. And I know this is heavy stuff, church, and I know that forgiveness is messy, and I can't even imagine some of the terrible things that you've had done to you in your life. Maybe some of you have been abused. Maybe some of you have been raped. Maybe some of you have been gossiped against. I don't know the specific situations. But I promise you that there is a God in heaven, a God of the entire universe, that knows them and wants to love you and carry you through those situations to somehow use them to bring about joy in your life and glory for himself. John Piper sums up this topic perfectly when he says, struggling to forgive is not what destroys us. What destroys us is the settled position that we are not going to forgive and we have no intention to forgive. God knows that forgiveness is really tough. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us as we struggle through the challenges of forgiveness. But just as Piper said, God didn't send Jesus to the cross so that we could be content with not forgiving. Without the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, it can be impossible to properly forgive. But here in our text, we see that God has performed a miracle in Esau's heart, and he has forgiven everything that Jacob has done to him. And after this great moment they have together, Jacob's family starts to arrive. And so first his servants, then their, ch- and their children, followed by Leah and her children, and then last are Rachel and Joseph. And when Esau sees all of these people, he asks Jacob who they are. And I want us to look at Jacob's response here in verse 5. It says this, And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given to your servant. Now, it's important to note here that Esau is not someone who fears the Lord. And Jacob would have been very aware of this. So Jacob could have just said, oh, these, this is my family, these are my wives, my children. That would have been completely sufficient of an answer to give to Esau. But that's not what he says. Jacob intentionally acknowledges the fact that he knows that, the, that his family are gifts from God. And this brings us to our third point today, which is a transformed life leads to radical proclamation. Jacob isn't holding back here. This is his way of telling Esau how amazing God has been to him all these years and to have blessed him with the family that he has. And it begs us to ask ourselves, what are we holding back in our proclamation of Jesus? You see, while this is a huge change for Jacob, this should be an incredibly normal part of all of our lives if we profess to know Jesus. You see, I mean, if we're going to follow anything that Jesus said, surely it would be this little thing called the Great Commission. It's found in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then in Acts 2, we see Peter doing exactly this. He blames everyone for the crucifixion, crucifixion, tells them that they're all sinners, and then proclaims salvation through the very person that they had killed. And we pick up in verse 37, just after he finishes his sermon, and it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And he said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Church, can you imagine if from one one sermon, 
God changed the hearts of 3,000 people in Eastern PEI. I truly believe that he can do this. And I believe that if he's going to do it, it's going to be through the local church, which means we need to get up off of our chairs and out into the world, out into the world and proclaim the gospel to those around us. Evangelism is not something that is just for a select few believers or just for pastors. It's something that every single believer in the room today is called to. And I know in my head that if we follow him in obedience, that he will be faithful in that. And I know that this is something that is difficult and something that can be absolutely terrifying at times. And I need to confess my hypocrisy to you today as I share this with you, that even this week I've failed at doing this. You see, I'm a, I'm a creature of habit, so I take the same route to and from work every day. It's about a 15-minute walk. And every day I walk by this man who's sitting out on his step. And the last, I think it was on Monday, I walked by him on my way home, and he asked me if I could uh, give him a cigarette or if he could buy a cigarette off of me. And I said, oh, sorry, like, I don't smoke anymore. And he looked at me, he was like, oh, that's okay. Can I ask you a question? And I said, absolutely, of course. What made you quit? And now I've already told you today that I stopped smoking the day that I became a Christian. And I am so confident that the reason I stopped smoking was because God transformed my heart. So what do you think my answer was to this man who asked me this question? I just didn't want to smoke anymore. The second that this came out of my mouth, I knew I had sinned. It was like, a, it was like in baseball when you're up to bat and the pitcher accidentally throws a, a change up right down the middle and you just watch it pass right by. God served up this opportunity for me to share the gospel with this man on a silver platter. As I was preparing for this sermon, talking about how important it is that we proclaim the name of Jesus to people around us, and I watched it pass right by. And when I got home to my apartment that afternoon, I just sat there for a while, and I was a complete mess trying to think through and process how I could have just done something like that, how I could have wasted such an amazing opportunity to share the gospel with this man. So with that being said, I want to challenge us, church. I never want you to feel the way that I felt when I got home that day. So let's not miss out on the opportunities that God has placed in our life to share the life-transforming power of Jesus to others even when it's difficult. And so often on PEI, the hardest people for us to reach are, are our family. Because there's this deep connection with them and we're, we don't want to risk losing that. We don't want to risk saying something offensive and they might not talk to us anymore. But here we can look to Jacob in our text this morning and see that even though he just reconnected with his brother for the first time in over 20 years, what was on the front of his mind was him telling Esau how incredible God has been to him over those past 20 years. And it doesn't stop there for Jacob. He continues to proclaim God to Esau, but now he continues on with his actions. You see, Jacob is following up his words that came out of his mouth with actions to support it. And he's demonstrating here that all of his hope in God or all of his hope is in God, and that he doesn't need the things of this world to satisfy him. This was the natural next step after Jacob sharing about God with him was now to demonstrate it. So radical proclamation also means proclaiming that Jesus is Lord with the way that we live our lives. And this is not easy. And when we decide to do this, everything changes. The way we deal with our finances changes. The way we parent our kids changes. The way we treat our spouses changes. And this is where all the wives elbow their husbands and tell them to pay attention to what the man is saying up front. But church, realize here that, that though Jacob could have been or would have been better off taking back all the gifts that Esau 
or that he had tried to give to Esau. He didn't. Now, remember how Howie equated camels with sports cars. Jacob sent 30 camels, 30 milking camels, because that was a big deal then, to Esau. That's 30 Porsches, along with hundreds and hundreds of other animals. But Jacob's eyes were so were so firmly fixed on God here that he didn't care about those riches. Jacob had experienced the transforming work of God in his life and realized that incredible generosity that was poured out onto him. And now he wants to show Esau that same generosity. This is the transforming power of the gospel today. And then right after this, we see another incredible transformation in Jacob's life. We've already read about how much joy Jacob now has because of the reconciliation with his brother. And I can't imagine how tempting it would have been for him to to take up Esau on his request and follow along with him towards Seir. But rather than just thinking of his own wants and his own desires, he thinks about his family and about his children and his livestock. You see, Jacob knows that Esau's livestock is older and stronger than his and would be able to travel at a much faster pace than his. And if Jacob tried to push his livestock too much, they would all die. And this leads us to our last point today, which is a transformed life leads to radical care. So rather than saying, well, forget my family, forget my livestock, I want to hang out with my brother, Jacob looks to the needs of his family and puts his own desires on the back burner. This is incredible. The man who was always scheming, always manipulating to try and get to the top is now placing himself in value at the bottom. Church, the only way that a change of this magnitude happens is through a personal encounter with God. And not just by any or not just by encountering him, but also by knowing and understanding what God had done for him. And now we have an even better and clearer image of what that looks like in Jesus. Philippians 2 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jacob is living out this text, and it's thousands of years before Paul wrote it. So church, let us learn from Jacob's example, but let us, uh, let us ultimately learn from Jesus' example that though Jesus had everything in heaven, he is God. He came down to earth as a man and came not to be served, but to serve. And so I want us to ask ourselves the question, are we truly caring for the needs of those who are weaker or less fortunate than us? Are we truly putting their needs above ours? James 1.27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, I want to take a minute and just explain that word religion in this verse because it has a terrible reputation and and I want to explain it because in in that text, we see Jacob practicing beautiful religion. You see, we've taken the word religion to mean a list of things that we can and can't do because of what we believe. But the true definition of the word religion is so much more than that. The true definition of religion in this text is this, worship as expressed through actions. So what James 1 is really saying here is that the pure worship of God is expressed through us taking care of the needy and those struggling in our society. So church, if, there's something that is, if this is something that is not part of our lives, if serving the needy and struggling isn't a priority to us, then we are demonstrating to the world that we don't really believe that we needed a savior to come and die on the cross for us because we were needy 
And we are needy and we are struggling. And this brings us back to what we were talking about earlier in regards to forgiveness. And just to reiterate this point, serving the needy and those who are struggling does not save us. But if we aren't doing this, it reveals in us that there's something wrong in our hearts. And I know that this isn't a fun thing to think about, but it's something that we need to take seriously. So many of us in the room today have grown up in the church. Maybe we said a prayer 10, 15, 20 years ago. Some maybe even longer than that. And for the longest time, maybe even as long as we can imagine, or as long as we can remember, we've just been on cruise control, going through life, not even thinking about God outside of a Sunday or outside of a community group, or when we really need something from him. Church, God desires so much more for your life than this. He desires that you would be filled with more joy than you could ever imagine. And this joy is found only through Jesus and serving him. And this is what we see Jacob doing throughout throughout our entire passage today. Now, don't get me wrong. For all the good things that Jacob was doing here, there is still a lot of sin in his life. You see, while Jacob is a new creation, thanks to God, he is still not perfect. We see countless times in our text today that the effects of sin on Jacob's life are still very present. In verse 2, when he's still picking favorites in his family rather than viewing them the way that God views them. All the way to the end of our text today, where at some point something changes for Jacob, And I'm not sure where this is. But you see, he knew he wasn't going to follow Esau towards Seir. And yet he continued to lead Esau on and let him believe that that's where he was going. And then we see Jacob head in the right direction towards the promised land that God had told him about. But he stops and comes up well short of where he's to go. And church, this is just like us. You see, while those of us who are found in Jesus are a new creation, sin sin is still very present in our lives. My life before Jesus was a complete gong show. My life after Jesus is still a complete gong show. The major difference here is that I am now a new creation and that God has revealed to me That Jesus came down from heaven, lived a perfect life, and then died on the cross so that I could become that new creation. That I could go from being an enemy of God to being a son. And just as Chris said earlier, he did this for each person in the room this morning. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He didn't die so that we could go on being comfortable living in sin. He died to bear the punishment that we deserved because of our sin and so that we could be made into a new creation, one that still isn't perfect, but whose desires are now to honor and glorify God. Church, will you stand with me? I want to I read us one more passage before we close today. These are two of my favorite verses. They're found in Isaiah 48. Verses 10 and 11, and it says this, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. God is jealous for his glory. And Piper describes the beauty in that for us by saying this, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Do you realize that God desires you to be satisfied in him alone? If you walk through these doors today and you are most satisfied by God, I want to encourage you today to go talk to Josh, go talk to Howie or the elders, come talk to me. And I know that all of us would love to be a part of that journey with you towards being more and more satisfied in God and in Jesus Christ alone. It will not be easy. 
In fact, it will probably be one of the most difficult things that you ever do in your life. But here's the promise I will give to you. You will have more joy to cling to in those hard times than you have ever experienced in your life before. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much that you are jealous for your own glory, that you desire to be praised, and that you are most glorified and most praised when we are most satisfied in you. So God, if there's a transformation that needs to take place in our hearts today so that we are most satisfied in you, I just pray that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would come and change our hearts, change our minds, and point us back to where you desire us to be. God, each person in this room you have blessed with incredible gifts. And the ultimate purpose of all of those gifts is for your worship, for your praise, and for your glory. So help us as we go out this week to use all of those gifts to proclaim who you are to the people around us. God, change our lives for eternity. We can't do this without you. So God, fill us with your spirit. Help us to be confident that your spirit is living inside of us. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.